Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a deeply inspiring discussion, and I'm, as a result, I think I'm going to try and take Monica up on her challenge for this stream of consciousness and riff as much as possible with um, the uh, discussions that we've had yesterday and today. Um, and so in, in that sense, I'm going to start with uh, the title, which I have tentatively shifted um, in terms of what I, I, I sort of understood the conference to be about before coming, which is that, um, to quote Jeffrey from yesterday, I probably suck as much as the next person at predicting the future with a capital T, but certainly I think that all of us um, uh, have dreams and hallucinations of the future, the, the, the possible futures uh, that could be afforded by uh, what we experience in the moment and certainly of our understanding of what has gone uh, forward in the past. So we have these constantly evolving uh, futures. And I'm going to share um, some of uh, the ideas of, of and the struggles of what we are doing in the moment uh, and what we sort of dream might be possible in the future uh, based on what we're able uh, to see on the horizon. Um, in this regard, I'm going to go back to the future with this uh, example. I'm, this is a, a still from the, or it's a series of stills actually from the Ames Powers of Ten from the mid 20th century. And I'm going to use it as a kind of measuring stick. If, if for those of you who haven't seen this film, um, I urge you to do it. It's about a 15 minute uh, film and it's deeply inspiring. It's basically a stringing together of a series of stills and it zooms in and out of them um, in a, a, a series of powers of 10 uh, images uh, so that you can see the human scale that we can visualize and then it zooms all the way down much further than this. This is a snapshot from the middle of the, uh, of the sequence and it goes all the way out to the cosmos and then all the way out to the atomic scale at the bottom of it. And um, what I think is particularly poignant in looking at this, um, uh, at this image is how uh, spectacularly the aims is, are really working on stitching together these scales within a motion picture. Um, they, they stitch them together and yet there are a series of stills, but why is the artifact actually a moving image across these scales? I show them as a fixed um, condition because ultimately we are still in a sense prisoner today of these fixed single scale conditions. And we are, um, I would say, attempting, uh, this is a very prescient uh, set of images uh, for what we are struggling with today, which is literally to design at these multiple scales to understand maybe the simultaneity of information across these scales. So if we look at um, uh, this series, um, literally from the left-hand side of the image, um, the morphology, the geometry uh, of the human body, the DNA, is intimately, intricately, and completely interdependent with uh, the geometry of the atmosphere all the way out to the cosmos. And we know that if there are subtle changes in our atmosphere uh, that there, they could affect and produce morphogenetic uh, changes at the smallest scale, scale within our cells. So I'm going to use this just as a kind of um, measuring stick, as I said, of interdependency, morphological interdependency across scales, and contrast it to our point in time right now. So the snapshot um, that we're looking at right now is our struggle with multiscalar modeling, or ultimately understanding and stitching together boundary layers across scales in the computer. And why is this so um, uh, significant for us today? I believe this does intersect with a lot of uh, the themes that have been brought up uh, yesterday and today. And just to start with a few of um, uh, the questions that were raised, um, Glenn Wilcox asked, are we designing space and or material? And certainly for the better part of 100 years, scientists have been telling us that our understanding of space and material is not as they are, are, is not, are not as they seem. And certainly I think the ramifications are coming to a full head now as we can say, are we really designing either space or material? Or are we understanding that we are actually manipulating um, energy flows through the man manipulation of, uh, of energy? We're, um, in a sense, negotiating the exchanges of energy at multiple scales. And there's a kind of uh, fantastic and, and, and stupefying beauty to these uh, changes, the effects of these changes. And yet at the same time, 
as much as uh, yesterday Heather had indicated uh, how much our tools change our cognition and how much they might uh, inform what we are able to do, what we dream of doing, I would also contend that our visualizations of how we can actually see ourselves and um, our uh, actions within uh, a, a very different theater and a very different uh, scale of operations also, in a sense, um, deeply influences our intentions and influences the way that we see what it is that we're doing and how we go about doing those things. So um, another thing about uh, tools and, and how we manipulate materials, um, I am indebted to my colleagues from, from the last couple of days of constantly going back to history and the way that we see history. So I'm going to also uh, um, answer this question about the virtual, uh, the relationship between the so-called virtual and the material and say that um, the way that we see um, these relationships um, are that virtual really are ideas that are not actualized, but they float either within our co um, collective uh, con cognitive structures or individually as we project them in documents. But certainly, as all the designers in the audience and, and anyone uh, struggling with making something knows, the artifact that we project, whether or not it's a text or if it's a, a drawing, is um, a small fraction of our dream, of our idea, of, of our collective ideas. And that if we zoom out in history and really look at our trajectory, um, I would say that this moment in time that we're living at really is the tail end of a kind of long trajectory from the Iron Age of um, manipulating material through heat, massive energy fluxes of, and, and uh, all of the things that have, uh, have, have, that's entailed within uh, how we've organized ourselves as a material society. The issue of being able to control these fluxes uh, with clarity, with ownership, um, and certainly with discrete um, identification has been very, very important. So that even if we look at all of our tools throughout history um, and how they've interacted with systems of notation and our way of visualizing or communicating information, um, we see a very linear trajectory uh, from some of the very first um, uh, forging of iron uh, and uh, uh, um, the manipulation of metal, let's say, to the way that we actually um, uh, carve and manipulate materials today. Um, even as, let's say, these machines um, require um, metal flows of going up to, let's say, 100 and, um, 1,200 degrees Celsius within a couple of seconds and back uh, to form uh, wafers and semi-metals, they are still fundamentally within um, a similar paradigm that we've had for thousands of years. So uh, to look at um, the way in which we're um, understanding energy flows very, very differently because of that map that I just showed of the globe, of really looking at the effects of our, uh, of our actions, of extracting very, very concentrated forms of energy and, and, and burning them in, in very controlled ways, that we are really also understanding that we can coexist with ambient energy flows in a very, very different way. And it's shifted our volition, I believe. I think we can see that emerging all over the world. Um, of um, understanding not just from, let's say, um, a kind of ethical standpoint or an emergent, uh, emergency standpoint in terms of survival or dis uh, averting disaster, but maybe I would venture to say within an aesthetic uh, desire of wanting to coexist in a very different way um, with um, um, uh, materials and, and the way that we organize ourselves as a material society. So I'm going to just um, use this as an example um, of, uh, in a sense, a kind of, uh, it's a system that we've designed and it's something that is uh, very firmly within, I would say, this kind of um, antiquated paradigm that we're living within right now that we're trying to bust out of maybe ubiquitous computing, cloud source. There's been all sorts of mentioning of partial engagements. Um, but, um, and Usman Haq yesterday um, offered, I think, a phenomenal example of how much we need to actually pr um, create performance environments within which um, uh, participants will want to engage in um, partial knowledge um, inputs and their identi identity or credit for having done so will be very, very different from the way that we've made objects in the past um, in a very um, sort of proprietary and um, identified way. So um, this is just an example. I'm not going to explain the system, but the volition of the system was, you know, the, the sort of typical uh, high performance trying to, you know, transform daylight, uh, diffuse daylight, interact with energy flows, absorb, uh, capture, transform, and redistribute heat and, and, and light 
um, into interior systems with, with the highest possible efficiencies. And so this is, that's what it exists what, um, at this sort of anthropomorphic scale or what we can see. And then we start to zoom in to these different scales and we see that they are the result, there's a kind of assemblage of highly codified and disciplinary areas. So we have um, microelectronics, semiconductor, um, optical engineering, and these things, these are all technologies that are, that are um, moving forward at a tremendous clip. I mean, it's incredible, just as an example, this solar cell is a, a postage size stamp that when we first started 10 years ago, for example, was only available for satellites at a couple of thousand dollars a wafer, and now it's six dollars a wafer, you know, and it, it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this kind of like instrumentalization um, and, and, and as, you know, I don't need to repeat what some of my colleagues have said about uh, the motivations of, of, of technology, but in a nutshell, it's a stringing together of discrete technologies in a sense that have been um, uh, developed um, with single scale models, or even if they have had peripheral vision, they have, let's say there is, uh, in, in a, the development of a system like this, we certainly have had dozens of what I would say are transdisciplinary designers, you know, ranging from physics to um, heat transfer, et cetera, robotics, but ultimately, um, there is a kind of disconnect. If we go back to this powers of 10 image and go all the way back to our measurement device, um, all of those images that, that we've shown thus far are ultimately, um, as I would say, along that paradigm of um, using massive fluxes of energy to manipulate material in order to affect some sort of um, condition. Um, and yet, we start to see the emergence of another paradigm in the last uh, few decades, which is um, probably, you know, the, the title of this, uh, this session called Smart Materials, or Smart Environments, I'm not sure what, whatever uh, that means. Um, certainly we see something different going on here. We see the um, cultivation, let's say, of, 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 of geometries, uh, the growing of geometries, um, the modeling of geometries according to, um, uh, according to desired behaviors um, that can switch, that can adapt, that can respond, that can interact. And yet, as I, I showed before, this is within a very, very, very small uh, one centimeter square matrix within, let's say, this very low value added matrix, if you will, um, or a kind of, this is our Neanderthal world, right, of, uh, of uh, architecture where we have s concrete and stone and, 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 uh, and we're forging metal, et cetera, um, at very, very large scales. So. Um, the question, though, is not what can we do, you know, at this moment in time, because that's exactly what a system like this is. It's a very instrumental adoption and transfer of uh, technologies as they're rapidly coming online and as we can transfer them. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to go back to this matrix for a second. As we can transfer them in order to do certain things um, uh, that will be greatly more performing or great, better performing, let's say, than, than technologies that came um, uh, before. But the thing that I really wanted to talk about more um, uh, sort of pertinently to the discussion is not what can we do, and, and let's say at that lower scale, we'll go back to this scale for a second. Um, oh, okay, well, the, the left-hand side of the, the gallium ar arsenide semiconductors and the switching of those, of those geometries at the different scale, but um, how they've, is that how, how does it completely shift our imagination to be able to um, affect uh, certain conditions. How do we think of ourselves differently as a result of, let's say, these global um, images of, of, uh, of light um, emitting, uh, let's say we call it pollution, whatever we want to call it, this sort of beautiful starry map of the globe at night, um, or of, um, uh, uh, of the recognition uh, that we're able to do certain things at other scales. How do we completely shift? How do our how do our intentions, our ambitions, our dreams, and ultimately our cogn collective cognitive structures shift as a, as a result of what we can do? And one of the things that I, uh, in relationship to the questions that came up, I think it was interesting that we were talking a lot about ego and authorship yesterday, and uh, this idea of so-called e um, egoless engineering, but I would say that, um, probably posit that, I don't know if human nature changes, maybe it does, maybe we are just physiologically changing uh, as a result of our technologies, and therefore we don't know what's coming um, around. And Bruce Sterling's um, uh, uh, um, 
declaration that he couldn't have known or he could not have, have um, uh, anticipated that there would be a shift in ambition um, as a result of ubiquitous computing that would relate to minimalization, min minimal um, uh, consumption being hip again. I, I would say that um, there's something that we know for sure, which is that we probably cannot handle uh, the complexity of the challenges that we've uh, acknowledged and that we've chosen to take on, and we certainly um, cannot even dream of the solutions um, through even coherent entities, disciplines, or um, uh, the means of ownership that have come uh, before, whether uh, they're about information flows or, um, as Keith Bessrud brought up, this black box that ultimately we're trying to control within, let's say, the production of architecture or, or um, uh, products of, uh, of any kind. Uh, the fact is that um, we will not be able to keep this in a box is what I guess I'm stipulating. We, and even if um, the ability to, let's say, work on multi-scalar modeling and, and, and cross-pollinate information exchanges across mo vastly different scales is, is the privilege right now of the rarefied few that might have access to supercomputer cycles, et cetera, the fact that we can do this and the, and the fact that we know um, what emerges from that will dramatically shift um, the centers of gravity that we know and the centers of power. And the question is, how, um, how do we nourish ourselves, let's say, within this kind of design process where um, the uh, older identifications, the sort of fixed identities that we've had as designers um, or as um, corporations, et cetera, that get fixed, get, that get branded, that have... Um, that will, I think, um, and have dramatically resisted um, this kind of ex information explosion and cross-pollination that could happen. Um, you know, what will that struggle entail such that um, our identities uh, are, are ultimately seeking uh, nourishment, not in that, that sort of fixed identity of our pro the projection of our ego into an object or, or into a product, um, but that we can understand um, and, and be happy with our participation in, in partial entities. So if we look, for instance, at this model um, and then imagine zooming out into uh, vastly uh, larger uh, continuums, if you have a, a lot of different people designing materials or cultivating materials and cultivating um, behaviors uh, that then get uh, de deployed um, into the environment at different scales, what happens when we lose completely the thread of contribution and credit? I especially um, ask this, not just in the context of industry or capitalization, but certainly in the context of the academy, because we are certainly, um, I would say, in a, um, in a kind of structured environment that uh, insists on credit, insists on clarity, insists on control, and insists on the categorization and separations that will uh, resist uh, these kinds of cross-pollination uh, flows of information that are both out of control, uh, impossible to identify in terms of their exchange, in terms of their beginning and their end. Thank you.